Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. The attention capturing capacity of visual stimulus. Well, what does that mean? It's that an observer can more easily detect and identify an object of importance. So, from 2000 to 2013, 61 firefighters in the US were killed when struck by a vehicle. They identified a failure of drivers to detect a firefighter was a major com- contributing factor. Go into a building, for example, chances are if there's a fire, Uh, that there's some smoke in there. Chances are that the electrics aren't working and the lights aren't on. And what you'll see is our technology is glowing and you can actually really see them. You know, in a situation where every single second counts, how important is that? This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative waterproof breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide Gore-Tex going further together Hey folks, before we get into today's episode, just wanted to introduce you once again to our mobile application, Drillbook. Now, if you listen to the podcast, you're probably the sort of person that likes to develop themselves. Now, Drillbook is built to be the home of training ideas for drill grounds all across the world. It's a library of content built by firefighters for firefighters. It's for training ideas, it's for incident debriefs, radio messages, we've got if code templates in there, knots and lines, quick reference guides, interview questions, answers, and guidance. So go in there, check it out. You want to develop yourself if you're looking to develop a firefighter on your station head into the app store or click the notes in the podcast links below luke welcome to the podcast hi pete um really good to be here with you today uh had a very good look at uh, a lot of the podcasts you've been doing over the uh period you set this up and uh, very very impressive i'm not sure whether your servers have melted down with the amount of downloads i've been doing you know what? We did get ourselves a massive, big, something 20 terabyte hard drive the other day because this is the beauty of it as well. Like It actually lives nowhere. It lives everywhere, but also lives nowhere. And that's the irony of, of a thing like this. But I wanted to uh, kick us off because when I was looking into, you know, obviously I came across your good self on LinkedIn and I'd seen the work that you and the team and the company have been doing. And the first time I actually saw some of the videos that you sent me, I actually interacted with it. I was speaking with my wife about it and it was that eureka moment. And I'm sure you have it all of the time where you're like, why have we not always been doing this? Or worse than that, my wife even said, mm-hmm. don't they already do that? And we said, no, because we ride horses and stuff like that. And when you go and look at all of our high-vis stuff, it's like, oh, yeah, it never did that. So we're going to go all the way into the weeds of PPE, into the world of safety, into the incidents that get caused, the assumptions that get made. But I wanted to start by framing it with uh, a little bit of the history of high-visibility workwear, because... This, again, is the the whole podcast is a massive form of personal development for me. And I didn't realize that when I was going into the weeds of it, it first came out, and please, because you'll be the expert on it, it first emerged in the 1930s. Am I right in saying that? Oh, well, there's been various, there's been various... Um, <laughs> Someone who yeah. claimed something of this. The reason I like this example is the man called uh, Bob Switzer. He said yeah. he saw his uh, dreams of a medical career squashed as a result of an industrial accident while working at a ketchup and pickle factory. And yes. uh, during the convalescence, he spun the idea of using fluorescent paint to create fabric. And that could be seen, which he then trailed, um, trialed her in his wife's wedding dress, <laughs> of all things. And Bob yeah. served this incident too. Went on to found uh, a corporation in sort of 1946 and then tried to develop or went on to develop a whole host of fluorescent paints and pigments. And that's kind of where my first introduction, you know, my dad ran a building company and then I worked in factories and had a number of rubbish jobs in industries before I was lucky enough to get into the UK Fire and Rescue Service. But I wanted to move then into sort of framing 
when you first engaged with sort of this sort of sector, whether that be industry or emergency services, and kind of give us a whistle stop tour of how you find yourself talking to me today. Sure, thanks for that, Pete. Yeah, I can go into more detail about particularly in the Please UK. Please do. <laughs> out of standards. Well, maybe I, I drop into that now as you've as you've raised it. But I, I always uh, tell this story. Uh, I can remember when I was a kid, and um, my best friend is father worked on the railways hmm. and uh, they used to have uh now i haven't seen you pete you're not as old as me but uh they used to i had a terrible childhood you, you, you no 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 i'm saying you look a lot younger than me but the the, the reality is uh that uh he'd, he'd come back from work and they had these things um called donkey jackets i don't know whether you've heard of them yes yeah uh, and uh they used to supply those onto the railways and uh he was having a uh, a bit of a dance around the fireplace. I can even picture him now, yes, because they just put a um, a rave glow, bright orange patch across his shoulders, yeah? Nice. And uh, he was, like, showing it off. And I was, like, thinking when I talk about standards and stuff that um, somebody at that time in British Rail, they, they didn't have to have it. It wasn't a legal um, uh, requirement. I mean, that started really about 1974, the health and safety I was going to say, that, oh, that that was a real game changer. You could just imagine the sort of things that people were doing before then. I remember speaking to somebody the other day about the chimney sweep industry and how that was horrific as well. Yeah, absolutely. And what you'll find, and it's part of my discussions today, is it's talking to you that innovation, what innovation does, innovation drives the change of standards. It's mm. not the other way around, really, because if you think about it today, uh, if you just talk about, flame retardant fabrics because we're talking about uh, uh, the um, firefighting market a standard is not going to come out that a fabric can't achieve is it no um, so you know it can offer it can ask for the best protection and it can set the bar extremely high no fabrics can uh, actually make that standard so what was the point in having the standard <laughs> what usually happens or how standards develop and uh, uh, move on is um, uh, innovation uh, shows uh, that higher, better, uh, brighter, all of these things, uh, levels can be achieved and then it's adopted and written into standards. And this I always is what think the standards are, are created like in reverse. And what I mean by that is we can have these big aspirations, but like you say, it's always based on the reality of what's available at the time. And people seem so accepting of that. They're like, oh, well, that's not achievable. And we see this with the contaminants market now. And they said, you know, the washes are only getting seven, you know, sorry, 20 something percent of contaminants out of it. And all of it's still in the fabric. Well, they probably yes. knew that a long time ago, but they couldn't yeah. set a standard because we need firefighters to go out there and do the thing. So absolutely. So what, what you've seen is, I mean, you know, you know, going on from the 1974 Health and Safe Work, work Act and then uh, 1985, they came out with something for the highways as a British standard, a 6629 standard, which said, well, there's, uh, there's moving cars and stuff around where we're working and people are getting hit. Probably we best uh, put something in there to make sure people are in high visibility clothing because people were then understanding and industry was understanding it's better if people are seen. Yeah. How much of it, though, when you see when you've been in those rooms and heard those conversations, do people not argue back things like, oh, we just need to train people better, you know, and push it back onto the person and say, well, it's their fault they didn't have a cordon in place or, you know, in, in the instance of the railway, it's their fault they didn't notify people that were working on the lines. Because back then, you wouldn't have even known if you'd have hit somebody, probably, because you're going that damn fast. And I've seen videos of people hit by trains and yeah. the, the driver won't even know sometimes. Yeah, the, I mean, the reality is PPE should be viewed as the last line of defence. But, mm. you know, we're humans, aren't we? So humans, uh, what we do is we err. We don't always follow every single procedure. We're not always aware of every single variable, etc. So it really is about uh, uh, being visible. I mean, there's studies that have come out, you know, uh, I've been looking at um, a great study that came out in uh, 2019 in America. And really, it's about what they talked about is the attention capturing capacity of visual stimulus. Well, what does that mean? It's that an observer can more easily detect and identify an object of importance. Yeah. I mean, you see, you see um, uh, stats come out. So from two, two, 2000 to 2013, 61 firefighters in the US were killed when struck by a vehicle. 
Mm. And what they what they identified, and uh, I've got this stuck in my mind, is that uh, they identified a failure of drivers to detect a firefighter was a major com- contributing factor. Mm. So it's how important I think is when it? we were talking the other day, it was that aspect of, and and again, I'm sure you have these revolutionary moments where people are like, by the time I've seen, how far do I really think my headlights can see? By the mm. time they pick up your high vis on your tuning, I've hit you. I've already yes. hit you. If I'm traveling at 30, let alone if I'm traveling faster than that on these country roads where, you know, I, I come from a rural area when I was on call and we were around the edges of bends and we were, you know, just in the middle of nowhere between farmers fields. And by the time somebody's seen you, it's too late. Sure. Sure. I mean, what we, our premise is always about, um, uh, if visual safety, um, does prevent, uh, accident and injury which mm. there's lots of studies which show it does mm. yeah um that and it's not just about cars and things yes it's about seeing each other yeah it's yeah. about you know uh, you know you've got a kango hammer in your hand yeah uh yeah. can you see the person next to you etc there's lots of different reasons why you should be able to see uh, uh um where visual safety um mm. uh, will drive incidents down in terms of uh um uh injuries or harm but you know the reality is anyway, to, to, to get to my point you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the regulations throughout the UK for example and it, similar can be seen across the world and, and um, there's a reason why I'm telling you all of this yeah and now it's enshrined in European legislation uh, through uh, 471 and then more latterly ISO 2471 now when we look at international standards today mm. on high stability yeah so it's the same in Canada with SCS standards. It's the same in Australia with their ASNZ standards. It's the same in America with their ANSI 107 standards, etc. They identify um, two sort of primary areas when they're looking at visibility. So if you just consider a high vis vest, for example, mm. uh, you will see that on construction sites um, uh, on the highways. Yeah, you can get them on the market. It, Five quid. Yeah, get them on the market. Yeah, I mean they're, they're usually bright orange or bright yellow, and mm-hmm. they have uh, silver stripes on them. Yeah. So what those two technologies are is one is the bright ba- ba- background fabric that's fluorescence, and uh, the silver tape is retro reflectivity. And what that is is little glass beads on an adhesive adhesive substrate, which basically mean that when light penetrates them, it bounces it back to the, to, to, to the original light source. Mm. These are immediately reactive technologies, yeah? And it's kind of, it's a bugbear of mine, because I'll go into the history of really where, where I've been interested in this uh, part of the uh, industry. But um, they are actually saying, the international standards are, you need light to be seen. Yes, that is a really so, crucial, definitive difference, is it? Do do we adhere to? And it might be a silly question for people that you work with every day, but I'm trying to take my mind a to my head and b to the knuckle dragon first responder that is probably listening right now as well. Do we adhere to all the international standards? I mean, because I don't know if Brexit and UK and all, because do we pick and choose things? Because I do see, you know, and we speak to people all over the world. PPE is a very wide spectrum, and very different applications and rules apply. I, absolutely, and I'm going to go into some of those standards a little bit later. It's not oh, a really thank you. story when I when when I when I started. Um, I suppose uh, 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 the whole process of getting VisLite DT because this is what the technology is we're talking about today. Mm. Um, just wanted to give you uh, a, a little bit of uh, uh, background um, on how we actually came out with this uh, this this product and what it does. It offers what we call is a third layer of protection. So it's not about fluorescence, which is a bright background fabric. It's not about reflectivity where you need a train or a car or somebody with a torch to be able to see somebody. It works independently as a light source for people working in low lit environments. Mm-hmm. So um, that's hence why we're talking uh, and we're supplying into the firefighting market because there's, a, there's lots of incidents uh, within their daily operation where they would uh, benefit from this technology. So to just give you a little bit of a, a snapshot, it's not about me, but uh, of who I am. No, um, I, I, uh, I uh, well, finished university and uh, 
I can remember I was after a proper job. Yes. <laughs> Didn't know what that was going to be. Did the business. We're still looking for a proper job. <laughs> yeah. This is about it but the uh i did uh did a business and politics degree so it kind of i didn't want to get into politics and things so i was like thinking uh while i'm looking for a proper job i just went down the job center and got a job in a warehouse that warehouse uh stocked high vis <laughs> hey. and ppe yes but mostly high vis so I, I i was picking and packing so that's how i got sort of used to it and the uh the the owner of the business uh said um uh, while well, you're looking for a job, would you come, would you go out on the road uh, for me? And uh, as a sales manager, I said, I don't, I've not studied to become a sales manager. I thought that, you know, I'm going to do something with my degree, etc. And he, he tempted me with a Ford Orion. Yeah, I remember. Nice. I was driving a Talbot. <laughs> you probably won't even know what one of those are. So it was a big step up. And I said, I'd do it for the summer. But I just kind of uh, went out, saw customers, kind of got involved in the whole thing and understanding of where all of all these products went to. And one of my customers had just landed a, and this will tell you how long ago it was because I've uh, been in the industry now for like some 30 years, but the uh, uh, it was a British rail contract and uh, uh, it was to supply all the high visibility to railway workers. And he said, I don't really know what we've got here, but we've just won this contract. Would you like to come over and run it for me? So... I uh, accepted uh, the opportunity and I went and got uh, to know all about uh, high vis and railway workers, joined the Railway Industry Association. I got my own pers uh, PTS, which is Personal Tracks Safety Certificate, so I could actually go out with workers and understand what it was that they were doing, uh, even when they were live line working, etc. And we did Pretty hard work in the rail industry, isn't it? I it's remember very... uh, delivering sleepers. I get paid cash in hand to do it for a couple of weekends. And it is hard graft in the middle of the night, usually. Yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, I mean, you raise the most important point there. If you think about railway work when they're repairing bridges, tracks, platforms, all this kind of stuff, it's done at night time mostly. And that's because there's less disruption to the services mm. because there's less trains that travel at night. So it was interesting, really, for me to try and understand um, how high vis works when they were uh, um, conducting their day to day sorts of uh, activity. And I found that um, the, the retro reflective stripes were very, very good from a distance for a train to at least sound its horn. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when they. Uh, they used to put uh, explosive the, charges as well, didn't they, down the lines? Yeah, absolutely. They did. Yes. So you could hear it coming. Uh, but the important thing for me was, and uh, uh, I noticed that that was okay. So a train's coming, and the train will know people are on the track, etc., because you can see the high vis from a long distance. But the lead uh, safety uh, um, um, did they? Did he uh, know? Uh, did she know everybody was off the track? And the only mm. way that they knew was actually uh, uh, with a torch. Yeah, yeah. Just to make sure everybody's off. One, two, three, four, five. So an independent light source already then, I thought, would have a, a big benefit into into the railways. Mm. But anyway, I ran that contract, cut a very long story sh short. Whilst I was at that business, we bought a fire clothing manufacturing business, and uh, that was assumed within the organisation. And I got really interested in firefighting and also visual safety and then uh, flame retardant safety, all that sort of thing, got involved in... Yeah, FR outer shells, moisture barriers and that, and um, designed a, a product. Mm. And I uh, ran that business in the end, and I was there for 13 years. Wow. And then more latterly, uh, when I left that business, I was working for an American business that ostensibly made lots of different products, but a lot of it was high-vis, and, and uh, we were manufacturing out of the Far East and supplying into the American and European markets. So... What I wanted to do, what was a very important part of uh, this this uh, clothing that I was manufacturing, it wasn't firefighters' clothing, it was high-visibility clothing. It was going into some very hard-end industrial uses and going through industrial laundry, etc. So what I wanted to do was to find the best uh, silver reflectives on the market. Um, because... Um, Reflective tapes are usually the weakest point of a garment. You know, yeah. when you're always the bit that falls off after you've done 10 washes, isn't it? 
Correct. So when you look in the label of your fire kits, uh, Pete, it'll say whatever, 50 washes, 25 washes, whatever it is. Mm. And that usually revolves around the tape performance because it's very mm. difficult to make it uh, stay on there for a long, long time. You know, mm. you've got abrasion issues. You've got. I was going to say, because it's the difference between whether they sew it, impregnate it or do something else with it, isn't it? And there is cheaper options that from looking at it, if you don't know what you're looking at, people just but, go for the cheapest. Yeah, but it can be the Achilles heel to a fire garment because at the end of the day if your if your tape is not working after a few washes and you've got to get rid of the garment you could stick you could be sticking twenty dollars worth of tape on the thousand dollar uh fire suit yeah right and also i imagine there's quite a few rules about what you're allowed to do to the garment in terms of whoever's providing the tape and all that sort of stuff you can't just say we want to do this with it and someone says no that's going to damage the integrity of the sure. tube. And there's so many so, hurdles and barriers there i bet there is you know and there's, there's a minefield of, of things so what what i wanted to make sure is that whatever tape i used uh, didn't diminish the performance of the garment yeah hmm. so i went out into the market and um i won't name any names but there's some very big players out there yeah and one of them was a company based in the uk called viz reflectives and so I uh, run, uh, it's a family owned business run by a gentleman called uh, Nick Robottom and one of his colleagues, his um, uh, uh, sister-in-law, uh, Mandy Hitchinson. And they they uh, they uh, supplied me with some tapes and I did a blind uh, uh, trialing with washing, et cetera, and uh, put products out there for sampling and trialing to the marketplace. And their tapes were the best by far. OK, these are just silver tapes. Yeah. So I started a relationship as a customer with Viz Reflexives. And I think I, well, I don't think, I know I became their biggest customer uh, after 12 months of uh, working with them. Uh, so we we got a, we developed a good professional relationship. And then one day, so a little bit about Viz Reflexives. Viz Reflexives have been going for 20 years uh, and are specialists in uh, uh, high-vis technologies, uh, uh, particularly in working with uh, things like uh, silver reflectives and bead technology. And Nick's background's actually, uh, he's done a lot of work in cryogenics and stuff. He's the real sort of the the, the, the driving force behind this product innovation. And what he did, he said, um, we were on a call and he said, what do you think of this? I've developed this technology. And he basically turned the lights off. Uh, I could see him on video call and the the, the vest which he was showing me uh, by turning the lights off, you wouldn't be able to see anything uh, by using an international standard vest. But this had this like DT on it. And what it did is it glowed. <laughs> yeah, it glowed. And I said, right, that's really interesting, Nick. That's really it. it Isn't so, that, that moment where your mind just explodes into a well, thousand listen, directions and goes, holy hell. Well, no, <laughs> listen, what, what I did, I, I did uh, very, very quickly. I went on Google, yeah, yeah. and I went on to Alibaba.com and everything else. And I actually saw, and you can do this, yeah, I, I saw loads of uh, what I now know as phosphorescent te technologies mm. out there. There's loads of phosphorescent tape, yeah? And uh, I was, like, thinking, and uh, my daughter's got glow-in-the-dark stickers on her bedroom wall. Yes, so we... <laughs> I, said, I remember, if you've ever been to a rave, uh, 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 these uh, uh, luminescent sticks you could have, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I actually found that's a different sort of luminescence, chemiluminescence, cause you, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I digressed. So I thought, there's lots of stuff out here. And Nick was um, applying for this uh, patent and everything. And I said, well, I don't understand how you could even get sort of a patent around here. So he said, no. He said, come and see me. So I went to see him. And uh, what he showed me and really uh, what stands uh, uh, still today is what this product does. It's about three things, performance, performance, performance. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that, it's... It absorbs UV energy extremely quickly. And then it releases it, which is in the form of a glow, very slowly and bright. And it's very, very bright. Yeah. Mm. And so uh, we did some uh, some very, very quick tests on it. And uh, uh, we, we could very, very quickly claim that if you charge it for five minutes, 
in sunlight, it will glow for eight hours. The first hour being the brightest and then it dissipates. But then, um, and I said, right, okay, this is interesting. Uh, very, very interesting. And I said, we need to back this up by all the scientific data and reports. Mm. Then I said to uh, Nick, I said, I know a market that this will be extremely... I'm sure you think of 10 markets. <laughs> it's like, then, wow. <laughs> Well, listen, listen, listen. Yeah, but I mean, for me and my background, I said to Nick, and then I, 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 I said, get your pen out, Nick. Yeah, so I said, uh, uh, I want uh, EN469, Structural Firefighting Standard, uh, EN14116, 11612, General FR Standard, uh, 61482, Arc Flash Standard, because of working in Arc Flash, etc. Uh, can it be anti-static, EN1149? Um, there's uh, a lot of people working in welding and uh, hot work processes, so the standard mm. that is EN11611. I said uh, there's also an, a wildland standard there. It's not just for structural firefighting, 15384. And then let's get it industrial laundered, so we'll use uh, 15796 standard. I said, uh, can you achieve that? It wasn't even FR. Yeah. So he said, "Right, okay, uh, let me." I work say on because it. firefighting is one of those really weird markets, and I wonder why. I wonder if this is why there's not so many people trying to get into it. Because, like you say, we kind of encompass all of those things. Because if you're just doing something for a factory, maybe you haven't got to consider wildland or heat or welding or because you know, in our urban search and rescue and international search, we 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 go into all of those environments. We go from the coldest to the cold to the hottest to the hot. You know, yes. it, it's kind of one of those really unique things that a lot of fabrics, innovations, technologies can't tick all of those boxes. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, and that's why I wanted to set the bar high. And what I didn't want to do is to go out to FRSs and say, well, you can use this for structural firefighting. Yeah. You can't use it for wild land. Yes. Yeah. You can't work in explosive atmospheres because it's not anti-static in this for this. And so what we wanted to do is to make sure that we covered all of the basis. And that's very, very important. We've got the product tested at minus 30 uh, degrees C. And we've had it in uh, uh, Arc Flash. Um, I was going to uh, say that's an important one because I found when we do our international search and rescue stuff, we went to Kosovo and we had some of those phosphorescent sticks and we had some stuff that we stuck onto our helmets and our bags and they were really crap when it got cold to be honest yeah so ours, ours worked that work that way so so what was important is that we achieved all of these standards uh this is for um uh, for sales into into europe etc and approaching into the european market hmm. um but also then there's other markets that we've uh, needed to get involved with uh for america for example and australia and there's other standards yeah. yeah we needed to make sure that the products didn't offer any toxicological effect as yeah, well the thing, isn't because it? when things heat up and they start to you know um perspire and paralyze they do when out when they're so close to our face and they're on our actual body and that's i yeah. think where a lot of products have missed the mark in the past because we didn't have the technology to test the toxicology of it and how much of it was yeah. being absorbed by our skins or how much we're breathing in. So, yeah, absolutely, you're absolutely right. So, so for example, our most aggressive product that we have, yeah, passes Urquitex Class 2. Well, what does that mean? It actually means you can wear it next to the skin, yeah? Oh, no. Even though it goes on outside of, uh, outside of a garment, you could actually yeah, that wear it. That opens up all the sporting market as well, doesn't it? Because you can put it, you could just, you could make a product out of it and, you know, that opens up all your ultra marathon runners and all that sort of jazz and your cyclists. Well, We've got international, uh, global sales through major, and I know you've seen because I've sent yes. you some. <laughs> we'll biggest, put the links to the website. People will be able to find it. Biggest suppliers on the planet, yes, 100%. that are wearing our technology and are, are sold out. I mean, just looking at the reviews on that, the sportswear stuff is absolutely amazing because what what major sportswear brands want to do is, I mean, uh, is protects people yes you can have day glow colors etc and that's for uh, uh running during the day etc but at night time uh what interestingly our technology does it doesn't just glow yeah what we've done and it's constant developing it what we've managed to do is we've managed to also put reflectance in there nice. so it will not only glow it reflects hmm. Because I think that's one of the things that stops all of these super cool, go fast cyclists wearing some of the older 
less technological products is because they do look a bit crap. But with the stuff like this, you know, because nothing more frustrating than when you see somebody coming at 35 miles an hour getting angry at you because you couldn't bloody see them because they're yeah. wearing all of their, you know, Gucci kit, but you can't bloody see them. I mean, that, 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 that absolutely. I mean, listen, our customers are uh, ostensibly the manufacturers, yes? Mm. Our, our direct customers are, you know, a sporting brand manufacturer. It's interesting yeah. you talked about horse riding, yes? We've yeah. actually... Yeah, we've got horse riding uh, clothing as well. It's for horse Wicked. riding. Some really nice stuff that we've managed to do. I'm going to get co- some for my wife. Absolutely. And we've got it. It goes on to uh, dog coats. That's an interesting one. That so is got- a great shout, mate. Oh, my God. Yeah, when we're doing our urban search and rescue stuff, you can't see it. And they have to end up having to clip little torches onto the back of the dogs because we can't see them. When we're doing missing persons and stuff like that, the dogs are one of your most important assets. <laughs> you said it. You've absolutely got it. So, I mean, the idea, I, I actually, uh, it's a f- funny story at this, uh, but I uh, went to my auntie's house, yeah, and she was babysitting a, uh, it was a Maltese uh, terrier. Don't know much about dogs, etc. <laughs> yeah. And she was babysitting this Maltese terrier because it, some footballer had just bought it, yeah? Mm-hmm. So um, she was babysitting that, and I went in the house, and uh, lo and behold, after I went in the house, we couldn't find it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was, <laughs> I know how much these things cost as well. I mean, I was worried <laughs> about the dog, but I was also seeing uh, 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 me having to foot a huge bill here. Mm-hmm. We did find the dog anyway. And I just thought, well, listen, this this has got to have applications there. So I approached a major. Um, uh, have they got these on dog collars? Yeah. So, so, so. Oh, mate, so, I need to get them for three of my dogs because we've got a German we, Shepherd and two Spaniels, right? And I know the Spaniels are like mud yeah. demons. That's why they're so good for EU SAR and stuff because they go bury themselves in bushes. And, yeah. it's, and, and by the time you've realized it's getting dark outside, it's too late to put anything on them because you're already out walking. But if they had that, yeah. mate, I would love to get some of them. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll provide you with some of those and you can do a wearer trial for us with your 100%. dogs. Yeah. Beautiful. But, you know, so it's gone into like dog leads and dog coats and stuff. But, you know, the, the, then coming on to the professional applications, you just absolutely nailed it when you're talking about you're doing USAR. Uh, and it's important, you know, where the dog is. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Because they're going to get to the person that needs to be rescued before you. And you could be in all sorts of atmospheres or it could be pitch black, etc. You know, and you've got also police as well. You know, when you've got dog handlers and stuff and the dog's uh, uh, running uh, uh, and actually uh, latches onto somebody, it's kind of important for the yeah. police officer to know where the, the dog is as quick as possible to stop uh, injury and harm to the dog or the person that are also attached to. So that's it's got applications with there. Have it's you done any work with International Search and Rescue? So I, I, I personally... Uh, I haven't, but what would have done is our customer that yes. manufactures these products would be supplying and dealing with. It would with, be yeah. a great connection. I'm happy to hook you up after because it's a small group of people, but it's, you know, we went to Turkey recently and stuff like that. I mean, the dog handlers in as an example, I think it's a team of eight or nine handlers. They would yeah. be a great test market for yeah. that for that individual, for that company. And they get, yeah. without being too businessy, they get wonderful exposure. It's for a great cause. They've gone to God knows how many natural disasters yes. over the last 20 years. And they really would actually, not like me with the greatest respect, walking my dogs yeah. in the woods, they would really test it. Yeah, that would be really, really good. I mean, we, we, will, do, also, we do also supply through one of our manufacturers. Um, the They have a, a, a disaster management um, uh, operation over there. Um, and I actually went and did a presentation several years ago. So they do use it for they have a lot of earthquakes and things and a lot of problems. Yeah. Uh, 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 ge- uh, geographical issues, etc. Mm-hmm. That they have out there. So um, yeah. So we supply that in the market. I think if you go to uh, Turkey as well, if you pretty much go into every, any brigade over there, I think I think we have the last stat was about eighty four percent of the uh, FRS is over there wearing vis like DT. Mm. So it's a very important uh, product, um, and we're selling it globally. We've you know we've now we're uh, supplying uh, in a market we supply all over the world from Australia right across Asia, the Middle East, wow, Europe, UK, lots of FRS is in the UK. Um, Africa. Well, I don't think darkness is a thing that's unique to the uh, UK, is it? Bless them. So that's again another fantastic aspect of this product and this innovation is it protects people all over the world. Well, it, 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 you raised an important point there. So we've got one hundred fifty thousand 
firefighters or so. Yeah, and that's growing. I mean, we got six brigades in the last month. Uh, oh. FRS that came on board. <laughs> Um, and that was really good. But it's not just for nighttime visibility. You know, if you think about, um, you know, and I've even sent you some pictures. Uh, yes, yeah. if, if you go into a building, for example, uh, chances are if there's a fire, uh, that there's some smoke in there. Mm -hmm. Chances are that the electrics aren't working and the lights aren't on. So uh, what we've actually seen, and, and this is uh, firefighters taking pictures while they're in there, yeah. and that they can see that they can locate um, their colleagues in there, yeah? Mm. And that's during the day. And what you'll see is our technology is glowing, and you can actually really see them. Mm. You know, and in a situation where every single second counts, how important is that? When we look at visibility, and it's an important few you... Um, factors to understand here yeah and we're looking at you know it's a firefighters pod podcast and i'll try and focus very much in there yeah we talked earlier about you know firefighters uh are not always at structural fires they're, they're, they're doing lots of different things they're at road traffic accidents and they're dealing with that um they're they're doing wildland firefighting etc but uh in terms of visibility, it's important that they are seen so they're not struck by cars. Mm. We believe our technology makes them uh, easier to detect in those seconds that you've got mm. uh, to, be able to do that. But the other areas is the identification uh, 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 and location of colleagues. Mm. I mean, another video I sent you, uh, Pete, I don't know whether you had man managed a chance to see it, but one of our, uh, the people I like speaking to is the actual end user, yes? Mm uh the, the the firefighter that's wearing the kit and i was at a show uh uh a few months ago and uh, i was showing up the latest technology which is pro fire which is mm -hmm. a, a new development that we've had um and um i showed this to somebody who came and on the stand and then we actually take them in the tent and they could see it and they said it's just amazing so i said I'm really glad you, you like that. He said, we actually wear your um, the FRA version, which is the 10 millimeter strips. Mm. That we've got. So I, I said, do you mind if I just... Uh, yes, you recorded, uh, yeah. Ask, ask for your reaction uh, on, on, on the phone. He said, no, no, no problem at all. So what do you think about it? So he says, well, what your technology does for me is when I go into a building, rather than having to put my hand on my colleague, I can just see them and it frees up my hand. That's what your technology does for me. 100%. So I thought, when I was watching so many of them videos and you're glancing around and if somebody's torch is working or if it's running out of battery, it, it takes yeah. away all of those thought processes, especially if we've got like a, people throw their mind straight into breathing apparatus where, oh, well, what people have got, a you know, DSU, a distress signal unit is going to be going off and they're going to have their torch on their helmet. A, maybe not. B, you've got the sound, which, okay, you might know you're in the right room or not. Helmet torch is on or off if they remembered to do it. And even if it's not facing in the right direction or they're face down on the floor, which they sure. most likely will be if they're hurt, you're not sure. going to know where they are. And they'll go, oh, well, we've got the thermal imaging camera. Yeah, right. great. If you can see through it and if you've, you know, if it's working and if it's not too misted up and X, Y, Z, and sure. the rest of the bloody room is hot as well, when you walk straight into it, you were going to see them. It's going to be like sure. the worst hide and seek in the dark ever. They're glowing over there in the corner on the floor. Sure. I mean, yeah, you, you absolutely uh, identified the risk there. So you've got to identify, uh, identify the location of colleagues. We think that's important. You know, mm. I um, read stories about, and I think we talked about this uh, previously, Pete. I mean, uh, I don't want to talk specifics, but I mean, there's instances where people, firefighters have not been able to be located in time. 100%. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that this technology is a panacea for every single situation. But what I am saying is that it does increase the chances of them being seen. Increases the chance of them being seen, increases the possibility of them being rescued quicker. I mean, those those are stats that... That's uh, what we were saying the other day. You know, for some people, they go, oh, yeah, but what 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 sort of a gain is that? Is it 10%? Is it 30%? Even if it's 1%, which it's not, it's far more than that, in my personal opinion. It's a, it's a game changer. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those many marginal gains that's going to collectively add to our ability to identify and rescue but, you know, members of our team. I mean, you're already, the firefighter in some ways uh, is at, at a disadvantage to the rest of the industries because you need uh, s such fabrics that have got really high protection, FR flame protection, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, those typically aren't fluorescent, yeah? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I do know that at RTAs, et cetera, that you do have a high-vis vest, et cetera, but, but you're going into a fire. I mean, a lot a lot of firefighters are wearing the yellow sort of uh, gold sort of products or the yeah. uh, black and navies and things, yeah, but they're not bright fluorescents. So yeah. this, what we do is all they're wearing really is a, uh, a, a tape on there, which is yellow, silver, yellow, which is yeah. around the arms and around the legs. But this definitely offers a, a different level of protection to that, um, a different level of conspicuity. You know the additional level for me, though, because when I saw some of the industrial examples of it as well, but then when I saw videos of firefighters, um, you know, we're going into back, back closets, you're trying to find fuse boxes, you're going into dark houses with all the all the electrics isolated, you're trying to pull something out of your pocket, have a look, just see where you're going. I was astonished by the amount of light that's actually emitted by it. So I think, and, and I'm going to get all the, te the terminology wrong, but the difference between glowing and emitting, I don't know if that's the right terminology to be using, but this genuinely, like you can hold, you can hold a pad in front of you and read it. It's not just yeah. glowing on you, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like we've had this conversation before, Pete, because you've been <laughs> saying all the things that I'm going to discuss, and it's really, really Sorry. important. You really do understand the technology. So the, the other area that's important, so we've talked about, you know, fatalities when people get hit by vehicles, hmm. uh, firefighters get hit by vehicles. We've talked about the importance of seeing the colleagues. The other thing is there's also to be located and uh, recognised by others. You know, hmm. so, so we did trials in uh, the, the, the UK. We did trials, and there was one that I can remember that we did over in Central America as well. And it was important uh, that we understood uh, about the design because they were using these 10 millimeter strips that go on the, the garments. And this, this one particular product uh, was, uh, they put some on uh, over a, a shoulder and uh, some around the bottom of the ankles. And what we actually found by that, when it actually went out into industry is that uh, they were identifying, it didn't look like a human form. Yeah. No. So, if you look at biomotion studies, et cetera, they talk about ways to strategically put strips, et cetera. Yeah. So it looks like a human form. So yeah, because our then, eyes don't pick up the entire thing, does it? We actually just absolutely. glance at something and look for a few visual indicators. There was a great study. Did you ever read the book um, Bounce by Matthew Syed? No. It's a great book. And because they were trying to measure reaction speeds and they went, they got like the fastest ping pong player in the world to try and have a go at tennis and see how they could react. But it wasn't actually a reaction speed that they were looking for. What they realized when they did the retinal scanning and all the you know, biomechanical filming yeah. and all that sort of jazz, what the person was doing was just looking at two or three indicator points on the person's body. They weren't even looking at the ball. They weren't even looking at the racket. They, because we don't see that. We just see patterns, don't we? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's loads of studies out there. So what, 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 what you'll see is, and again, I've sent you a lot more videos that you can see, is that what manufacturers have been doing by engaging with FRS is they've been trialing and sampling, et cetera. And uh, you can see the placement now is pretty much all over the garment. I mean, it, it, it does um, uh, it make me laugh in some ways that I've seen, uh, you know, have you seen the TikTok videos? Yeah. Yeah. And so a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the end users, the firefighters, are actually videoing themselves when they're in dark situations or smoke filled situations, etc. And they literally light up, yeah. Mm. And looks you can tell because it's all over the garment, etc. You can tell in an, in an instant that it's uh, you know some people call it stick men configuration, like yeah. stick man. You know, it's across the arms and uh, down the, the chest and waist and that sort of thing, and you can tell very 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 quickly. That's really important when. Um, you're talking about potentially interacting. If you're going to save somebody's life, they're in a burning building, etc. It's for that child, it's for that man, woman, etc. To instantly be able to see, oh look, that's that's somebody over there, yeah. Yeah. and I'm over here. Yes, and it's it's not just about you seeing them uh, uh, in an instance. It's about them wrecking and seeing what they recognise. Yeah, I don't know what brands uh, it was that chose to use it as well, though. But some of them have actually done the lettering on the back which i think then really helps when you're glancing across you know a, a pitch black roadway you can see who actually belongs to fire and i'm hopeful like police and paramedics will adopt yeah at some point. so we supply we do we supply this to police and paramedics as well i think you've seen some stuff on that that's really important i mean there's a great interesting study about paramedic uh incidents over in uh, canada 
which talks about most of the incidents that they had and collisions, etc., um, were when a paramedic was out of um, uh, external lighting. Mm. They've actually study that talks about that so we, we're doing some brilliant work over there in canada etc with these well because their pp these... i think is far worse not because they're not as good as us but i think maybe i don't know the way the markets or the way that the people that produce these garments look at it is they don't they consider fire in like an extreme environment so our ppe tends to be much more rugged and rigid and we wear it for everything even if we're just going into somebody's home we're in our tunics and our jackets but a paramedic a lot of the time they're just in their greens or their blues or whatever. And it's just with all due respect, it's, you know, you know t-shirts and, you know, shirts and sure. trousers, isn't it? And it's a difficult physical discipline, personal discipline, sorry, for them to consciously say, I need to change out of this now because I'm entering a hazardous environment. Correct. Yeah. But I mean, they, they, they do wear high visibility, but they, 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 the shortfalls, which we talked about in high visibility in the standards, it doesn't offer them that third layer yeah. of protection our product does but you know go, going back into the visual recognition and, and firefighters uh the other the other benefit this technology uh brings is not just about identifying uh, uh each other but it's and again you've seen some videos on this it literally lights up the room yeah yeah so when we're talking about slips and trips and all these sorts of things you can uh, you've got a better chance of seeing things around you because it's a positive light source that's lighting up the room. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, uh, end users that have told us you can literally read. Yeah, depending yeah. on where the strips are on the garment, you can read um, um, off it the glow uh, in front of you. We've got projects on the go with glove manufacturers and um, firefighting footwear manufacturers as well. So it can literally light up the way forward and they can see the hands mm. uh, uh, more easily. And that's uh, all what we believe will be... Um, are some of those things a cost aspect? Because like for me, I'm like, what stops us just putting it all over the product and, and on the helmets and everything? Like, I imagine well, that's just a cost factor, is it? Well, listen, cost, cost is always an issue. But the way... Uh, I mean, I was at the uh, NFCC um conference last week and they had a great things at west midlands fire and i took a picture of it yeah and it was actually caught, uh, it showed the evolution of fire clothing yeah? yeah and i've heard about you talk about it on other podcasts podcasts as well but i mean you know literally um in the you know 70s and 60s and stuff from wool barathea jackets yeah. and people <laughs> you, know, you know where was the money for all the technical high technical fr fabrics there yeah mm -hmm um so money money is an issue but then again it's always got to be in comparison with what uh uh the perceived benefit of protection is and better that's the protection. sad thing about it isn't it i always think these innovations move forward one death at a time yeah you know i mean you know it, it, we can only we can only uh guess i mean i i started off talking about 61 firefighters were killed by being hit mm. uh, by vehicles between uh, 2000 and 2013 in the us i mean could of this technology save one of them we don't know but what we can say is that if visibility is an issue this report says it is mm. yeah and identification if you're increasing visibility which we argue this technology does, there's like DT, um, then it increases safety. I mean, yeah. that's one of the things we can definitely, definitely They're the unfortunate about. questions that have to get asked in a debrief, isn't it? Because like when somebody does go, was visibility an issue? Let's factor that. And so people go, yeah, yes, yes, no. And the next question usually is, well, were they wearing the high vis? And as soon as somebody says yes, they'll go, right, well, it must have been a human factor then, or it must have been it something else. Be it's a, yeah, it's but a harder push to go into, yeah, but is the thing we asked them to wear good enough? Sure. But, you know, these contracts, um, as you know more than me, they, 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 they last for a long, long time. I, I know contracts that are out there for 10 years. I know. Yeah. It's not good, this, te this technology was not available five years ago. Yeah? So I know, and there's, uh, there's firefighting kit that's out there that's going to last for several more years. Yes, that we, this technology is still not going to be able to uh, be put onto yeah. those elements. Um so it's all part of evolution, yeah. Well, that, even that's not an absolute because if people stamp their feet enough and they see the benefits that other services are getting, it, it is just a you know it is just a scale. At the end of the day, if the desire and the need gets high enough, and we we demonstrate the safety aspects of it clearly enough, then sometimes it is a justification for those people to turn around mid contract and say, 
I'm sorry, it has to be this. And that's when if you if you're able to push that through in, in legislation or in tenders or in you know procedural requirements, then that that's I mean, the big lever that gets shifted, isn't it? The the biggest thing for us, um, Pete, is exactly what we're doing today. Yeah, it's making firefighters and the fire industry aware that mm. this technology exists you know and mm. we do this you know very very uh, uh, good at marketing and uh, getting the messages out there you know but it's a global marketplace mm. you know mm. it, we're, we're a very small technologically driven business what we've mm. done is we've uh, engaged with a global distribution network with a company called Coates. I don't know whether you're familiar with them. Yes, they make... they're, uh, they're on the beginning of a few of your videos, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, they make uh, uh, most of the world's threads. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's a big organization, but they they are uh, a global presence. And what they're able to do is they're able to access markets locally where we can't. Yeah, uh, you know, because they've got people in Japan, or they've got people in Guatemala, or they've got people in Brazil or Peru or etc., yeah. who can locally support them, stock them, etc. So it really is about now we've got a distribution network in place. It's about making firefighters aware that this technology is available. Every single contract we have secured, whether it be a firefighter or a sportswear manufacturer, has mm -hmm. continued to purchase the product. Yeah. yeah not a spot buy and then move on what no. we're doing is we've really develop a, a standard and i think what's really important to understand if we if we talk about the technology a little bit more yes please is about the performance yeah this is what makes it you know hugely different from the glow in the dark stickers that my daughter uh, has on a bedroom wall so what it really is to try and understand how the technology works is about um Inside an atom, I'll try not to get too scientific. Mine goes technical as you can, because I, I like when I was watching some of this, and I think on one of the videos that you provided me with, it, like so many other things, nature is one of our best um, teachers, isn't it? And then when I started seeing some of the examples, you know, when you look at jellyfish and when you look at other animals, that 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 scientific side of it, we'll have unknowingly already seen a lot of this on Blue Light, uh, sorry, on Blue Planet, but realizing yeah. that we can start to understand now through through the innovations of, of companies such as yourself and you know the the original designers of this sort of stuff how how far down that rabbit hole can you take me i'll try and stay with you oh well no i mean uh, i mean the, 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 when we talk about things like bioluminescence and photoluminescence and all of these things um you can see how uh, you know, if you if you talk about Darwin's theory of evolution, etc., how do things survive and last? Yeah, well, they in lots of instances, and you can see it whether it be a firefly, yes, mm. or you could see with them. I mean, there's glow glow in the dark frogs actually, and they actually use this technology um, to either attract or repel, yeah, mm. because it's noticeable. That's what it is, and you would think that if you look down the lineage the very fact that they're surviving today is because they've managed to attract a partner yes and therefore their their species can then go move forward in terms of procreation or they've actually repelled uh uh being eaten yeah or yeah. attacked by something so you can see lots of instances all the way through uh um uh, the animal kingdom for example but what we've done with actually the 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 um the products that we have is actually it's rare earth yes it's taken out of, uh, the earth and it's um has these properties in itself yeah but we we use a really pure version of it and i think what's very very important to understand is uh why it's different mm. and that really is about its performance yeah so for example we have this product and it's a glow in the dark product and uh, we had a look at, right, okay, so what do we, we think it's really good. And uh, we tested other things on the marketplace. Why is ours better? Yeah. And uh, 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 let's prove that ours is better. Yes. And we, we knew ours was better because that's really in the chemistry. And that really is down to our patent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really exciting uh, uh, news because I, when I first saw Nick about how can we get a patent, well, we can get get a patent because it is different. So what what we wanted to do though is actually look at its performance criteria. 
and there was uh, there was a DIN standard out there six six um, seven five ten that just talked about uh, phosphorescence glow performance, right? So we just ran okay, right? And then uh, the only actual standard we could um, find was outside of that was for safety signs. Oh yeah, seventeen three nine eight, right? So, it, and I'll explain to you why our product's different, but safety signs I understood. And you see, if you're in a cinema, Pete, mm -hmm. you, you will see the exit or uh, uh, clearly lit up there. And that uses a form of uh, phosphorescence. Yeah. Or uh, fire signs, you know, for uh, exits, et cetera, in buildings mm -hmm. when all the lights have gone off can use um, phosphorescence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at their standard, right? And we looked at the highest performing uh, category, which is category D within that standard. And our glow performance was twice the highest performance within that. Now, this is really exciting because you need to understand what we've done that's different. And what we've done that is different. If you think about a safety sign, for example, right? A safety sign is a rigid object. Yeah? yeah. You could put a form of phosphorescence, even though it won't be ours, you could put a form of phosphorescence on there and you could put it on a, an inch thick. Yeah. Because mm. it doesn't need to do anything. Yeah. Our product's different because it needs to go on uh, garments. It needs to be pliable. Yeah? So you've got oh, to, yeah. it, it's got to achieve all of the standards that I went through, for example, for a firefighter, mm. and there's more, yeah? Plus, you've got to be able to either sew it or you've got to be able to heat apply it on um, onto that product. And guess what? Then you've got to be able to go through all of the FR, and then you've got to then be able to wash it. So because it's then it moves as it's being washed, etc., to make sure all of the pigments we use and the beading systems, et cetera, don't fall off the product. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what the difference is. It's hugely uh, um, impressive in terms of performance, in terms of brightness and glow. Um, but it's also, it's commercial. What I mean by commercial, it means it works out in industry. Yeah. And that is that is uh, something that's very, very unique in, in what we do. Um, and to be able to engineer that product, to be able to do all of those things is extremely expensive, extremely difficult to do. And uh, it's that initial colossal investment of the of the research and the R&D side of it, isn't it? Before you've actually got, you know, a, a viable product that you can actually go out there and lose. Because I'm looking at it now and, and it really is an important distinction between that phosphorescence versus fluorescence, isn't it? Because it effectively, by the looks of it, it, it captures an, a high energy photon. Or, yeah. uh, and then it, it's the difference between it's uh, it's it's like it sits in my like a triple barrier by from what I'm trying to read from it, and then it holds that electron until it's released by a random spike of almost like thermal vibration energy. It it sits behind that barrier versus something that immediately bounces it straight off. Yeah, um, um, absolutely. I mean, in layman's terms, I mean, if you can think of an atom, yeah, mm -hmm. and then it's got electrons going around it. These electrons inside the pigments that we use, what they do is they get excited by energy, yeah? Mm. And that energy they, they get excited about um, is in the form of UV energy, yeah? In their, ex 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 uh, in their excitation form. mode, yes, they absorb. Yes, they're going to absorb. So they're absorbing and absorbing and absorbing. And it's kind of like, it's almost like an intelligent light system when you see it work because... You can't see this technology working. It's not glowing when yeah. there's light there because it's, do you know what? It's um, it's actually engineered so that it's in the absorb phase. But what happens is when it's they stop being excited, that means there's no UV on them. Yes, that means for me and you, when you go into a dark area, they then release it. Yeah, they release it. And that released energy is in the form of a visible glow. And that glow, I find that um, fascinating. That glow operates at a nano wavelength of five five five, yeah, visual wavelength. And what does that mean to me and you? It is the most attractive uh, uh, color 
to the human eye that it's possible to get. Wow. So I'm imagining this stuff in, in the science of it does exist in different colors, but we just don't pick up on them because it's not hard for people to, I mean, if I try and bring this down to a really, really peat level, it's like yeah. we're always emitting heat, but you don't see it until you use a certain technology that allows you to see that thermal radiation. And then you can see it ga gather more and then you can see it slowly lose it and you can see it transfer it and all of that sort of stuff. But when I think about Absolutely. this, like you say, you can't, you can't inherently see it or feel it um, until yeah. you come into that environment. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about also there is about colour. So so um, um, we don't want to change the colour no. for a firefighter, for example, because of, uh, exactly as I've explained to you, it, it emits the brightest colour to the human eye for, for detection. But we're dealing in lots of different marketplaces, leisure wear, sportswear, etc. I mean, you, we talk about horse riding again, yeah? We've just done a, 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 issued a major project. And what we've done is we've actually, um, in our own labs, we've uh, developed colour, yes? So uh, That's a great that shout, because then you can only identify that person. You can identify that's a horse. Or there's a person riding a horse because they're in that colour. Absolutely. Well, listen, it's, it's done more for aesthetics more than anything else because uh, I have to tell you is if you change the colour, you change the performance, so it's not as bright as the yeah. human eye. But um, uh, if you put it on a very expensive, nice ladies' horse jacket, for example, where they've just <laughs> uh, some of the orders have gone, yes, it doesn't want to stand out as a uh, as a yellow stripe on the products, and you can you can't even tell it's in there. Unless mm. you walk into a darkened area, etc., and uh, then it then it glows. Absolutely, mm. it glows. Yeah, uh, horsey people are very much against anything that looks like an emergency services where I would wear it. I think it is a very, with the greatest respect, and I put myself in the market. It can be quite an elitist place to live. Yeah, I understand that, and uh, you know we're developing products for different marketplaces, etc. But you know, at, at the end of the day, and this is what we needed to do. Uh, uh, now understanding how the technology works, and it passed all these standards. Yeah, um, really to understand firefighting, mm. and, uh, really how that interacted with our technology. And so, if you look at it, um, Pete, what's very very important? We yet yeah, we can say. Okay, you're outside uh, in the sunlight, etc. Five minutes, it'll glow for eight hours. I actually have got stats that prove you can still see it after 42 hours. Yeah, mm. but that's, I think I've seen uh, the time lapse videos of that as well. Uh, yeah, and I also mean, how but, far away you can see it. One of the videos, yeah. how far does that person go? That's 200 meters, but you can see it from Jesus. further. You know, it's uh, um, it's very very 200 important. meters. Particularly, that's massive. Yeah. Well, particularly if, if you, you don't know where they are and you can't put a torch on them, but you can see them in the distance, that, that certainly helps. Yeah. You know, but what, what we wanted to do, though, when we come back to, against the performance, 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 Pete, this technology is, you know, if you look at the home office stats, and I was looking at them for 2022, but they're all, they are pretty similar uh, throughout the years. If you look at the response times, for fires, for example, they, they talk about, you know, they break it down in three sorts of areas where they took call handling time, yeah, mm -hmm. which they've detailed at one minute, 27 uh, seconds on average. Then the crew turnout time, that's a bit we're interested in, one minute, 34 seconds, and then drive time, five minutes, 55. These are just averages, etc. Mm. So what, what So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the worst case scenario for a firefighter and our technology. Yeah. And um, the worst case scenario in terms of charging, etc. then we, we assumed that the garments were not uh, hung up in the station. Yeah. Mm. So they had no sort of station lighting, etc. to be able to charge them. We assumed they're in a dark locker. And it's, it's still the case in, in, uh, for some fabrics that uh, firefighters um, use. Uh, they're, they're susceptible to UV degradation. Yeah. So they don't like to be out in the uh, in the light uh, more than they have to. Yeah. Mm. So that's fair enough. So we assumed uh, that uh, the the firefighters would have to get their fire kit out of a dark locker. So there's no charge on the product. Yeah. Mm. Then uh, we didn't want to look at one minute thirty four. We said lock. Uh, and I've seen some of the <laughs> and you can see them online. How quickly can you get your PP? P P P yeah, P, yeah? <laughs> uh, etc. And they have races and stuff. So 
what we did is we looked at one minute uh, and then we looked at very, very low lighting. So just mm. to give you sort of background, we do all of our testing on a thousand lux. Mm. So what does that actually mean? Well, it's very, very low light charge. For example, yeah. today... Right on your website, dusk is a thousand lux, isn't it? And then uh, our normal office lights are like 500. Yeah, correct. But if you, if you, if you look at um, sunlight today, for example, it's 150,000, yeah? Wow. Look, so what we've done is we test our... Uh, products and then what we do is we assume then the firefighter they do get the ppe on in the station lighting because they can't do it in the dark but then we assume that there's no more light in the cab there's no more light even when they get to the incident even though uh there's usually lots of light yeah, yeah. fire creates light you've got street lighting you've got the lights from the cabs and trucks etc etc but let's assume there's none we we can prove that you can actually still see see this technology glowing after three hours, yeah. Wow. Um, so that's really really important. That just in a minute charge, you can still see it. So I've it doesn't my... have to be sunlight. No, definitely not. Office lighting. That is a really important thing that I'm really glad we didn't miss because uh, this. So this Perfect actually gets lighting. Absolutely, yeah. uh, that's a works. game changer. So... So, so we're looking at, and so what we do is we replicate this, and this is done independently, yeah? We replicate and simulate station uh, types of uh, charge, uh, station lighting, and what that does to the technology, and that's produced an independent, verifiable uh, information reports. It's important if we're talking to FRSs that we can mm. say and stipulate this. Um, and the, the reality is that um, the, the most important part of that glow as well certainly within the first hour and that's when it's the brightest so that mm -hmm. should be able to get them into a situation where they're actually uh if, if they've got to go into a building etc it's working and this is worst case scenario you know many of the other scenarios scenarios work uh, absolutely fine if it is daylight it doesn't need to be sunlight it charges just as quick if it's a cloudy day yeah Wow, um, but office lighting. Actually, that makes sense now when I think about the idea of things working inside cinemas or inside offices because they're never exposed really to daylight. Yet they will continue to glow, won't they? Yeah, absolutely. And you get it on strip lighting for things like uh, uh, airplanes. Mm. Yeah, got it on ships. You know, markers which uh, uh, can point you the right way if you know the lights have failed and it's dark the right way to the life rafts and all that kind of stuff. So, but uh, as I've explained, that technology is is, is great. Uh, but uh, the, the the key has really been about, uh, and this is where our USP is, is about applying it into a commercial way, into, so it can be in uh, uh, structural firefighting, for example, or sportswear, or whichever markets that we operate in. So that's you know, for it. those kits that haven't already got it. Are they able to? Is there any like? straps or you know there's velcro all over our kits and stuff like that are there products that they can retrofit obviously not sewing or putting anything onto their products but for those people that are locked into seven year long contracts do you have like small products that people can put onto existing products i mean it's, it's an exercise if it, if it was an frs came to us and said that's something that they want to look at we'd have a, have a look at that um uh, about retrofitting mm. uh, but that it's a very that's an involved process. There's oh, many God. layers, lots of decision fire, makers involved. Fire, in that, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, just in terms of the mechanics and engineering of it, yeah, um, uh, you know, putting it on not in a flat state, the garment wouldn't be in a flat state. It would yeah. be, you know, you've got arms and legs and all that sort of stuff. Hmm. Um, we've, we've. Uh, I thought you were talking about uh, when you uh, um, separate kits. Well, yeah. we do supply it for, um, uh, it's in retail stores um, in um, Canada, for example. We've do done a big project there that we, sorry, we're still working on, but we're doing a project there that they can, you can buy it in a retail store and you can either, because we do it, you can stick it on helmets, for example. Yeah. Yeah, you can buy so, the tapes. I'm looking on the website now and you can literally buy, buy the tapes and the films separately. Correct. Yeah. So you could iron it on yourself, et cetera. But when you're dealing with uh, a, uh, firefighting kit, you really need the manufacturer involved and understand how that could could be, uh, mm. and how that how that could work. But you know, when you think you think about the different areas as well, um, that the 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 products 
goes in, it's not really just about night time. And we keep saying that. We looked at that scenario, which is worst case scenario in terms of charging for firefighters. But, you know, um, we supply this to all the UK postal workers. Yeah? yeah. They did extensive trials. Now, you'd think, what? What? So, you know, they're, are they posting at night time? Well, do you know what? In winter, it gets dark at three in the UK as well. Yeah. And um, if you think about, you know, with French railway workers, et cetera, they, they buy the products and they did extensive trialing. It's mm -hmm. just like, um, if you think about, let's just forget about nighttime for a minute. You've got airport baggage handlers. Yes. Yeah. Now, these big junkers that I get on that fly over to the Far East, et cetera, on a bright sunny day, well, guess what? They're, there's very shaded underneath it, yeah, and there's moving trucks and there's all sorts of baggage and stuff moving around. And it's it's darker in there, it casts a shadow, yeah? Mm. Not just that. If it's bright outside, yeah, how the eye is operating, yes. it's, it's bright, so the eyes, uh, your pupils dilate because you don't want to let so much light in because it's blinding you. And then there's a, there's a, a lag time when you get into shade as well, mm. and then it, it needs time to open up. That's why in the military and stuff, they use a lot of red light, don't they? So that their, mind, their eye can adapt quicker. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, if you think about things like mining, people working underground things, if you think about even things like forestry workers, we sell it uh, uh, on major forestry contracts, right? Because they're working in dark, shaded areas during the day and they've got chainsaws, mm. yeah? They're in under trees and all sorts of things. People working at heights, you know, which yeah. firefighters do as well. Yeah, uh, where is the firefighter? Where is the the electrician, etc.? You know, can you see them? Is that you know, can you get to them quickly? Have they had a heart attack? They, you know, is there any issue, etc.? It's about keeping them visible. So what we argue is that if anybody's in a in an environment where it requires them legally or uh, morally uh, yeah. to be in high visibility, so you want to put your staff in high vis even if you're working in a you know an a low risk environment etc what we're saying is that if you accepted that high vis increases the the possibility of uh, accident if you add this third layer of technology it offers visibility in low light low light conditions we would argue are more treacherous because of the nature yes. if you can't see either where you're going or you can't see where somebody else is mm. by increasing, by adding this third layer of visibility, vis like DT, it has to increase safety of an individual. Mate, I find what... they are the most dangerous times. We always cover this in like incident command um, training because when we put people at incidents at different times of day, uh, they try to follow the same script as they would do, expecting they're going to turn up to an incident at you know 10 a.m. in the morning or something like that. And one of the last considerations is always requesting resources for lighting. And then lo and behold, 30 minutes later during the you know decision-making exercise that we're carrying out with them, you'll say, right, it's pitch black now. Well, they're using a simulator and they can't see anything. And then they finally remember to make the request and they've still got to wait another 10, 15, 20 minutes for the thing to turn up. And then, you know, they haven't got enough light on the instant ground. They don't know where the firefighters are. And it adds another, and it just rushes up on you. You know, especially in the UK, it, it sure. can take, you know, 30 minutes or something. All of a sudden it's pitch black. Absolutely. You know, and the, the reality is, Pete, the technology now we've been supplying into uh, the market, we've been um, supplying now for five years. Um, and we're developing and developing and developing continuously, and it's getting into more and more markets. And there's a reason why workers are choosing this product. There's a reason why, because you know the difficult conversations we have at, had at the beginning, and they, they're always hard with new innovation. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in front of fire chiefs in Eastern Europe, etc., and I can remember we just developed this technology. Yes, and we've got. Uh, and it's passed all the certification, you know, fantastic. It's passed all the certification. You can wash it. You can be seen in the dark. And, you know, I did a presentation over there. I can remember this one, and I was in front of the fire chief who went, great, that's amazing. He said, uh, who else is using it? So yeah, I said, well, no, that's we're annoying. We're just coming out to the market, yeah? Uh, and then there is a there's a there's a there's a reticence that you know um, even though the fact markets about innovation and everything else, but to be the the first, mm. yeah, 
to, to, to see. They don't know what they don't know. Could there be no, another? No, those early adopters, you have to find those rare ones, don't you? Yeah. So when you've done that, I mean, listen. Then now the you're pendulum on... starts to swing. The beauty I love about the product is there's almost no explanation required. It almost crosses all the language barriers. When you see some of the wonderful visuals and the videos that you've sent me, and we'll share these with everybody as well, sure. it's such a obvious thing. And, and then you're like, it, it doesn't matter if you don't even understand firefighting or you don't understand personal safety or the safer person concept. It literally is. It doesn't require language. It's amazing. Well, it, it, listen, it's a, it does sell itself. It's a visual product. And, you know, I love nothing better than uh, in, in terms of uh, reaction, yeah, in actually going into a completely blacked out room, yes, with a firefighter uh, with two sets of kit, one which is what they've got today, and one which could have our technology on it, yeah? And the reaction. The only reason you can stay in that room and have dialogue is because you can see each other's faces because the garment uh, that um, one of us is wearing is lit, is lit, up, lit up the room. And it literally lights up the face. And you can see the reaction. It's absolutely it's uh, fantastic. And that's why I'm so passionate about this product. It's about getting the... The knowledge out there. I still have conversations, Pete. You, you know, you'd think, you know, and I've heard you talk to fabric suppliers, etc., and they've got the best fabrics. And why isn't everybody buying this uh, fabric, etc.? Because it does this, that, and the other. Yeah. We've got the same issues here. You know, I have conversations with procurement people, not necessarily in the fire market, etc., that just say, "Well, listen, um, it adds cost to the garment." And I say, "Well, yes, you don't get it for free. Uh, <laughs> that's true." <laughs> And he said, and and there's no international standard that says I have to have it. Yeah, that's real. They're the, the conversations that happen behind closed doors when people espouse virtual value. Um, sorry, they espouse yeah. those values when they're out in the public facing and saying, yeah, there's no cost for firefighter safety or police officer safety or that sort of stuff. And then the ugly side of it that I'm sure you see far too much, and I'm sure you interact. I'm sure you interact with lots of fantastic people, but there will be odd ones that. You know, actually, they are the bean counters. And we do respect them and we do need them because, you know, we are spending the public's money. So we do no, need no. to make sure it goes in the right place. But this is really a no-brainer. Well, listen, what, what I have to say is that, you know, if we talk about the UK, I think pretty much every every contract that's come up, including the Ministry of Defence, we supply all of their firefighters, etc. So I think virtually everything that's come up in the UK, uh, since this technology has been available, all of the contracts uh, uh, we've secured, all of them, pretty much. Uh, Still a big and... land grab to go, though. And the exciting thing is, I don't think anybody's anywhere near doing anything like what you guys are doing. So I think it's all up for the grabs. Well, l listen, you know, you know, we we we, we, we had the pain with the innovation. You know, at, at the That's beginning, it. it's yeah. hard work. It's the you story know, of that twenty-year overnight success. It's listen. It was it, financially, yeah. I mean. Uh, you know, at the very, very beginning as well, it's like how how much longer can, you know, you can keep going. I mean, yeah. the, the amount of money that's been put in and time and resource uh, uh, to, to make it work, you know. And we've, we, 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 we've had some meetings where we sat down and said, right, you know, this is what... Uh, uh, you don't this get this next contract, right? it's game well, we over. Can, we, yeah, and it was all about that, you know. And now we've got brigades in in Australia that can talk to you know uh, brigades in Asia. You can talk to brigades in Africa, uh, Central America, Europe, and about their own experiences having this technology. Mm. And what we've done is you know it's what's really really important, and this is where the future takes us. Yeah, we'll get people, I imagine, trying to copy our technology. You know, sure. we do patents, etc. But you know how these things work. We're in constant... Surprised nobody's tried to buy you out yet. <laughs> well, that's a completely different story, yeah. Exactly. But... <laughs> we won't talk about that one, but I'll bet there's been the, a few. The, well, maybe after this podcast, Pete, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, you know, there's constant development and innovation. You know, we've got labs and we've got washing machines and we've got FR um, uh, machines that to test for FR performance and all sorts of things in the labs. And what... Uh, what the team do there as well is they 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 develop this technology um, and are constantly developing it. And so you've seen on some of the videos there, and hopefully show them with some. Uh, yeah, well, we'll uh, share them all on the platforms, and we'll make it available through a link on in the platform. Next one. That uh, we we've, we've actually put three technologies and developed in, into one tape. So that's the firefighter, 
uh, one you've seen where in the daylight it looks no different. You don't see any of these 10 millimeter strips, etc. They just yeah. look like they're wearing what they'd normally wear, which is yellow, silver, yellow reflective tape. But what we've done is we've combined the yellow element, which is the fluorescence, which is the daytime visibility, the reflectivity we've put in the middle there. And uh, that all conforms to all international standards for standard tape. But what we've done is we've put special technology behind it, which is a uh, Vizlite DT, our next generation of technology, which is that glows. Is Vizlite DT FRA one that I'm looking at? The FRA one is 10 millimeter DT Pro. If you look at DT Pro. Ah, uh, yes. Sorry, I can see that one now. We'll put this in the links for everyone because I can see what I'm looking at. We've but... already, I think we've, we've just come out with that uh, the tail end of last year. We've already had four or five brigades confirm that's what they're moving forward with. Wow. And uh, so this is, and this is made, uh, we, we, you know, Nick, clever that he is. I mean, he's, he's actually been, he's had to make and modify the machinery to make the technology because it's just got, you know, it's just not even anywhere in the world, the machinery to make this technology. So what we've done is everything is uh, for the pro fire range is, is made in the UK. Is he really? Yeah. Made in the UK. Oh, wow. It's that is British something you should product. scream about more. We, 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 we are so, so proud of the fact that uh, we, uh, we do that and we, are, you know, and we can sell this out globally. So um, uh, we, you come and see us, Pete. Have a look at it going yeah, down I'd the love line. To. I'd love to come and so, meet you and come and see you guys and girls. And, and this is what I love it. most about it. I always say to people, like, you know, let, let me come and visit. You haven't got to pay me to come and visit. I mean, that rubbish. Just, I would love to actually have first-hand experience with seeing and, and touching and wearing this stuff because they're, they're the champions. And I'll go on and talk about this now on probably every podcast I speak to about PPE. But, and that's the beauty of it. If you can really embed that knowledge – within the boots on the ground. They are your yeah. champions. They're the ones who'll go out and tell you how good it is. So what we're doing, some other funky stuff, just to let you know about, particularly for fire, which is, uh, I really do think uh, it's sexy because safety is sexy. For me, uh, I think if it, if it means saving lives and accident, that's, that's the uh, difference of this stuff. It actually does look really cool as well. <laughs> Most safety doesn't, but this stuff looks really cool. You would, because I think maybe it triggers that, that raver within us all that, you know, takes us back to our childhood and you look bloody cool in it. <laughs> and listen as you've seen on all the tiktoks and everything and uh, yeah they're uh they they absolutely love it but love it, uh, you know the, the, the reality is is it's making them more visible and that's really important so what we've done is we've, we've commissioned some research which we're going through at the moment so we've got different varieties of the technology that we're working uh, on uh, some that you've seen some that we uh, have developed and some that we are developing. And what we're doing is we're, we're testing it in different sorts of dark environment because mm. dark is not just dark or light, yeah? But also what we're testing, interestingly, is also in different smoke um, uh, yes, environments. Because well, how light travels density. through smoke is a very different factor to consider as well. But I love that you're actually taking the time and the R&D investment to do that because you could quite easily rest on your laurels and go, we've got a viable product, it works, but that clearly doesn't align with yours and, and, and you know, no, so, sort of entrepreneurial so, side. So what we do is we test and uh, we, we make all this funky stuff, but what we do and what's really important for uh, anybody specifying in, in, a, in, a, in any fire authority across the world is everything is backed up by independent empirical verifiable reporting and and research yeah so what we do is if we claim something yeah you uh, we get those reports from there's not many labs that can actually do this work as well that deal with uh, our particular type of phosphorescence yeah but um so we get that backed up by independent reports that do say yeah in these conditions this is what the globe performance means and this is what it's uh, uh, the benefit can be um, because uh, it's very important for us to uh, not just say these things, uh, mm. but to prove yeah, them. To back it up. <laughs> you know, got to do that. So we talked about that call handling uh, at time, crew turnout time and drive time and all those funky things um, um, uh, re regarding average response times and things. I said, uh, in terms of the performance, that has to be backed up in that minute performance of what that actually means so that we can put it across to a firefighter and tell them what that means in terms of their day-to-day -day activity. Yeah. What we like about this technology, 
um, is it's independent. It works independently. So there are products out there, and you've probably seen them, like LED light systems, which work yeah. off batteries and wires. And yeah, doors. that's what I mean. Some of the stuff we've had clipped onto our helmets or strapped onto our bags with the international search and rescue stuff, it just fades over time, and then it's a ball ache to get it off and change it, and you haven't got a spare, and you have to carry spares. And I, I think, I think, I think the difficulty is actually a, it, a, how it works in action. Yeah, it's okay, yeah. you know. And again, you know, what happens if the battery fails? What if the um, uh, what if, if you forgot to charge your battery? It requires uh, a constant you, interaction from the person to remember stuff, and then we introduce that human error, doesn't it? And it's just it and, always fails. And then like. because it puts out uh, because it's uh, actually it uses a battery, it's got to make sure that it does. It has to be MC tested. It doesn't interfere with pacemakers, or if it goes into explosive atmospheres because it's got a charge on there. And I have worked with these sorts of systems in the past. Mm. I even did, we talked about the railways, we did it. But what we actually found out with the actual trialing of the technology, actually making it work in, in, in uh, the course of their day-to-day -day activities just didn't make sense. You know, plus yeah. there's a lot of issues with weight and certainly flame retardant and washing and all of these things. Yeah, yeah. This technology that we use, Viz like DC, if it's on the garment, you don't even have to think about it. That's it. The job That's is it. done. You don't have to stand under a light. You don't have to uh, put a switch on. It knows uh, when it's dark because of the way that it works at, um, at the uh, at atomic level. Uh, it knows when it's dark, and that's when it goes into release phase. Yeah, And it just continues to work. The only um, uh, uh, trick, really, to is it, to it after we've developed uh, the pigments and uh, uh, is actually how it's then adhered to because it's very, very important that the, it doesn't come off the technology. So the adhesive systems we use and the layers and the layering approach, the packing density uh, is all really, really important to understand. You know, on our heat applied product, for example, which is almost like it's like an iron on that goes on there, there's six layers that go into that, just one tape. And that tape can't be a thick layer that then is making the uh, garment not uh, be able to bend, move, stretch, etc. So it's um, really the science behind it is is really important, really mm. important. But also the manufacturing process, how we actually get to make that tape, and it consistently performs and performs at that level. Um, you know. Each of the batches we run, we test it for all of the things that we claim. That's really important. So you've got full traceability. And that's really uh, a key part of supplying, particularly in this market, firefighting market, because you need full traceability on performance. And uh, so we need to make sure the product we send out does what it says on the tin. And that's what we do. And we test it in our labs and we can prove it. So... Hey, I think really... it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's an incredible product. I'm I'm constantly bowled over as I start to stretch our arms out a little bit further. And also as like the tide is turning and we're getting so many uh, subject matter experts and sector experts such as yourself sort of approach the podcast and want to talk about what they're doing. Because what always makes me so sad is a lot of people only see this innovation third hand or they're lucky enough to see a video somewhere or they're chief fire officers have eventually decided to come and tell somebody about the really interesting conversation they had with Luke, you know, seven months ago. And what I love about this is that we're able to shortcut that process and then build that groundswell. Cause I'd love to see firefighters now across the UK and across the world. Another, you know, we have a lot of other emergency services, people listening in as well, really start banging the drum from their end as well. So that for those decisions that are made for financial reasons, aren't the really pivotal ones that stop innovations like this making it you know down to the boots on the ground yeah i mean the key, the key thing to me uh Pete, really and and this is why i'm so grateful that you've invited me uh, on this platform today is to get the message out there and it could be that an individual frs for whatever reason doesn't want to buy this technology that's okay I have a dog in the fight. I do want, uh, I would love to sell this technology. I understand that, yeah. But I want them to make that decision based upon that they actually know about this technology rather yeah. than they were not aware. And it's the great work that you're doing on on, on your podcast and uh, um, similar 
uh, platforms where I've done things on YouTube, etc., that are going to hopefully try and get uh, uh, the market to be aware that this technology is available. You know, mm. and at the end of the day, I love this job because the more successful we are, the safer the industry is. And if I can think that I've potentially um, stopped somebody being hurt or potentially saved a life throughout the course of what I do for a living, then what a greater way to uh, um, have a job. I mean, you you guys get to see it at the front end. I couldn't do your job. Uh, but yeah, but we... we're useless without all the kit. <laughs> you know, to be honest, we're, yeah, we're, also, yeah. we're, we're eternal problem solvers. So we are really fantastic at solving things, but it relies on all of the structures, all of the control staff, admin, manufacturers, sure. you know, R&D people that are behind there. And and, and you said it great there. It's, it's not, whilst you, you know, I'm very thankful for, for your appreciation for what the podcast does, but it's, it's not about me. It's not the Pete Wakefield show. It is only where it is. And it's very strange to have seen it grown to what it is. But sadly, it's actually a great articulation for the fact that this information wasn't getting out there in the first place. And that's the only reason it is as successful as it is. And also to yourself, Matt, I mean, you'll speak to no doubt loads of other fantastic, intelligent, knowledgeable people. But if they can't get over themselves and have the willingness to come and have these conversations, and I say get over themselves in the most respectful manner, because it is scary and some people don't articulate themselves as, as well as you do, but you just can't just just talk about it because this will be listened to probably you know thousand well, it will be listened to thousand times but also not just now not just like an advert on tv or something like that this will be listened to for the next god knows how many years you know it lives on the internet forever and that's why it's so important what you're doing because what you're helping to do is you're becoming a vehicle for people like myself and uh other people that have got uh, products and innovations that can help with firefighter safety to get the message out there. So mm -hmm. it's a huge thing that you're doing. You should be very proud of what you do. And it's very, very um, professional, but also fun. I think and you get the messages across uh, in a very, very cohesive way. So we love what you're doing. Uh, the people uh, at Viz have been listening to your podcasts as well. So they're all excited. Some of about them are rubbish. <laughs> Some of them are great. Yeah, I've not listened to them all. It's, it's, it's the same left. thing, though, isn't it? It's R and D. It's we're constantly developing, constantly iterating. I try and um, get better at what we do, and just just continue to provide the platform for you guys and girls. But look, man, I, I really, really appreciative of your time. I know you've got family and everything, and people won't know that we're recording on a, on a Saturday afternoon. But I really want to thank you for the time. Um, if anybody does want to find out a little bit more about this, we will put it's visreflectives.com and go and specifically have a look. Uh, the new VizLite DT Pro stuff, because that's the real game changer. And I think that's a lot of the stuff that we're seeing coming out into the market now, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. That's our uh, latest technology. And we think it's uh, uh, the Glow performance um, is uh, tremendous on that. And we're getting some extremely good feedback, which are culminating on uh, FRSs globally that are um, now starting to buy that product. Um, so uh, very, very pleased about that. Um, would also like to offer to you, Pete, and anybody else who's on the podcast, if they ever want to come and see us, uh, we're based in the UK. We, we uh, uh, would love for you to come and uh, see our factory and see that uh, how things are done. Um, I'd love and, to do that. I really would love to do that. And, uh, yeah, we're, it's a very uh, British story that we're very, very proud of. So and uh, we'll long, long may it uh, continue. And it's only with uh, the work like you're doing, Pete, and getting the message out there is uh, is going to certainly help and at the end of the day it is about increasing safety and the, the more the key messages get out there i think uh, the better chance we have thanks so much for your time today luke i really appreciate it pete really appreciated your time and uh, no doubt we'll speak again yeah Firefighters podcast is put together to develop, inspire, and hopefully even motivate those individuals who have chosen to serve our communities and be part of the first responder family. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter Pete Wakefield. If you have enjoyed today's episode and you want to see the podcast continue, please head over to our Patreon page where you can support the ongoing efforts of the podcast. Please hit that follow, subscribe, or rate button on whatever platform you're listening to. Please support your emergency services responders, and thank you for listening.